Thanks so much to the Cultural Landscape Foundation. And for me too, it's really an honor to be on this panel, especially with Beth and Martha and Kate, um, as well as to pay tribute to Cornelia, who really approached design as an art, an experience, and an attitude with a collaborative spirit of risk, research, and responsibility. So today I really wanted to share some thoughts about cohabitation, about beauty, and about our ever-evolving relationship with nature. The concept of aesthetic quality in nature as distinct from beauty was developed in the 18th century, and it really expressed the appreciation of fear and of uncontrollable forms of nature or turbulent nature, as opposed to beauty, which was talked about as a pleasurable experience. And the sublime was really described as a quality of greatness beyond all possibility of calculation, of measurement, or even of imitation. Today, of course, um, humans continue to have this evolving relationship with nature and with beauty, and nature is no longer being defined or perceived as untouched wilderness. Yet, it's also not widely understood as designed, either. And turbulent nature is more omnipresent than ever with the effects of climate change, and beauty can easily be dismissed as superfluous. Today, only 23% of the land, excluding Antarctica, and 13% of the ocean are actually seen as truly, quote unquote, wild. And megacities are rapidly rising. This is the remaining wilderness, forests, tundra, marshlands, grasslands, deserts, and coral reefs, alongside rapid urbanization, densification, with increased pollution and extraction. So while we're confronted with this stark contrast between those two worlds, the dwindling wilderness and the rapid urbanization, I too, as, as Beth was arguing for, would like to argue that as our natural and built world becomes more and more interwoven, there's really an opportunity to expand and redefine beauty, design, and our relationship to nature. And in the process, perhaps invent a new urban nature of cohabitation that conflates the two. Towards this end, and as the world becomes more and more designed, I really believe that we need to specialize in four equally important ingredients. One is urbanism, sort of cities, buildings, development, infrastructure, and public spaces. Two is ecosystems, the natural and green systems, sustainability, resiliency. Three is community, cultural heritage, social cohesion, civic discourse, and equity. And four is design craft, artistry, material specificity, and beauty. I want to also acknowledge that this notion of cohabitation is not new. It's deeply embedded in indigenous people's traditions and belief systems. These foster an intimate relationship and respect for land and water, and a strong sense of place and belonging. I've really been inspired by the Navajo worldview of Hoju, so this is often translated as balance and beauty, and this concept emphasizes states of harmony and the many connections that link the ephemeral and changing parts of the world together into a larger significant whole. Beauty is actually central to the Navajo life and thought. While Western societies often emphasize beauty as a surface phenomenon, beauty for the Navajo encompasses ideas about health, about goodness, and well-being and a harmonious relationship with other people, with the natural world, and the world of spiritual beings and forces. And I really think this concept captures so much of what we are talking about here today. So in moving forward, I sort of feel like I need to argue for applying and relearning the lessons from the past. So with the lens of cohabitation and hoju, I'm really trying to touch on a few projects, not to go into depth, not to sort of herald them as model examples, but rather as a provocation to talk about ways in which landscape architecture is leading, is creating value, and is having impact as well as shifting mindset. This is Quan Hai Water City. It's located in the Pearl River Delta, which is mostly reclaimed land with extremely poor water quality. And our proposal was really for a sustainable new city for four million people, shocking, in Shenzhen, China. 
Our design really seek to emphasize and organize development and infrastructure through the use of water fingers that functioned as both amenity as well as green machines to improve water quality. And these water fingers were really linear parks. They were designed to absorb stormwater. They were designed to filter. They were designed actually as widened and extended from the existing water tributaries in the area. But they're also envisioned as productive, not just green and living, but designed for people with varied social uses and experiences. The, four, the 45 hectare Guiwan Park is actually the first water finger to be built, and its design really naturalizes the existing tidal corridor, creating various habitats through sculpted topography while protecting against flooding and retaining and cleaning stormwater. This park actually opened yesterday, so it's kind of a, <laughs> a big, exciting thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it interweaves urban programs with significant habitat, including freshwater, wetlands, and mangroves. There's actually 13 acres of constructed mangroves. Um, and at low tides, there's large areas of bare flats that are exposed where waders and waterfowl gather. It has a greening ratio of more than 70 percent. But getting back to sort of Beth's point, these are not only doing the sort of functional technical aspects. They create immersive experiences in forests in a dense city with opportunities in constructed wetlands to sort of promote interaction and learning. Moving on to the West Coast, the South Bay Sponge includes some of the lowest lying and most vulnerable communities to sea level rise in the Bay Area. And at the same time, it's an area that's growing rapidly with plan without any plans for increased housing as well as transit connectivity. Our work as part of the Resilient by Design initiative covered more than 20 miles of shoreline in the Bay Area. Building off of the current restoration of the South Bay salt ponds, the sponge actually used remnant marshlands, newly restore, restored salt ponds, as well as newly constructed wetlands to form a regional flood protection strategy. But it also provided a powerful and legible identity to create floodable parks and green spaces at higher elevations alongside new and existing neighborhoods and development. While the sponge takes nature as its inspiration, the project goes significantly further in imagining a more holistic model for adaptation across the region. It provided strategies not only for adopting shorelines, but also for improving new transportation infrastructure as well as affordable housing. And our approach really made this complexity as simple as possible to understand through the deployment of a clear and accessible metaphor, a sponge and that not all sponges are actually alike. We worked closely with the surrounding communities to shape a living framework for adaptation, including creating a mobile hub, which was dubbed the Sponge Hub, which actually went directly into neighborhoods, engaging over 1,000 people. The project also defined a new South Bay multi-benefit resiliency district, and this was really formed to unlock multiple funding mechanisms, as well as to create a collaborative framework for evaluation, for prioritization, as well as implementation of projects. So I also couldn't sort of um, not talk about fresh kills, especially in the context of New York. <laughs> so at 2,200 acres, I mean, this is literally a project of a lifetime. I've worked on it for over 20 years. At 2,200 acres, Fresh Kills Park is almost three times the size of Central Park, and it's really the largest park to be developed in New York City in over 100 years. For nearly 20 years, we have been transforming one of the world's largest sanitary landfills into a new type of public urban park, where the dynamic staging and the process of making, remaking, and reclaiming is part of the design, which also helps to foster and nurture the stewardship of the land. Fresh Kills is really a world of contrasts. It has this unusual combination of natural and engineered beauty, an artificial topography and infrastructure composed of synthetic geotextiles capping the garbage below with leachate collection systems, methane extraction systems, and flare stations. But all of this is also set alongside creeks and wetlands, expansive meadows, infinite horizons, and of course the spectacular vistas of the New York City region and lower Manhattan. 
The LifeScape proposal done in 2002 was really a process of environmental reclamation and renewal on a vast scale. The idea was about recovering not only the health and biodiversity of the ecosystems across the site, but also the spirit and the imagination of the people who would use the new parkland. The man-made slopes are transformed as ecological transects moving from upland to wetland with habitats that attract key species and increase wildlife. And the park was really envisioned as one that could have seed farms or composting fields, tree farms alongside large-scale wilderness sort of programs such as camping or mountain biking or boating or cross-country skiing right here in New York City. And the idea was to use techniques such as soil making, these are some of the big diggers on site that were used to create the landfill itself, as well as successional planting and landform manipulation. So all of these sort of legible and visible efforts were really also meant to change the perception and the negative connotations of the land, and this included revamped sanitation trucks, the development of native meadow mixes for landfill cover crops, as well as the introduction of goats to actually help control the invasive Phragmites. And Fresh Kills has naturalized over time. This was an image taken about two years ago. Fresh Kills is now a place for wildlife and recreation, science, education, and art. The interior of the park is currently only accessible during scheduled park programs, but this also allows for a culture of experimentation and innovation. In 2012, actually, there was a land art generator initiative um, at Fresh Kills, and this was an ideas competition to design a site-specific public artwork that in addition to its conceptual beauty also had the ability to harness energy. In this submission, the helio field here was a network of solar modules that rised out of the prairie grasses, but they also generated electricity to power 1,800 homes for one year. Perhaps most exciting though, today Fresh Kills is also a platform for environmental research. This includes afforestation, habitat restoration, wildlife biology, soil productivity, water quality, as well as alternative energy generation. But it also is looking at new attitudes towards park usage. Another project that we've been working on for a really long time is Shelby Farms Park in Memphis. This is located 12 miles east of Memphis. And Shelby Farms Park is really positioned as a central resource for a larger metropolitan population, although many people didn't even know that it existed. At 4,500 acres, the park is one of the largest urban parks in the U.S. with a mission to showcase Tennessee's ecology as well as Memphis's vibrant arts, food, and music culture, as well as to create an active nature-based hub for recreation, health, and well-being. The master plan began in 2007, and there were a series of concepts that were really meant to unite the disparate areas of the park to enhance ecological connectivity, as well as to amplify the existing resources and distinct landscape types. The 195-acre phase one, called the heart of the park, is now complete, and it's really defined by Hyde Lake, which is, was expanded by 30 acres to increase stormwater retention, as well as to provide significant capacity for boating and recreation. And this transformation includes hundreds of new native trees, dozens of acres of wetlands, meadows, lawns, and plantings, but it also really is a new model for exercise. Memphis has the highest uh, obesity rate in the country, and that's really due in large part to a lack of access to exercise. So this makes Shelby Farms Park even more impactful. There are now 40 miles of trails with a path network that allows people to travel by foot, by bike, by horse, by shuttle, and by boat, which promotes various forms of exercise. It hosts community and regional events for people to come together and is home to the Memphis Kids in Nature program, which encourages kids to connect with nature through exploration, inspiration, discovery, and fun. And the park is now really heralded as a model for resilience because of its significant role in connecting fragmented natural systems, it's increased stormwater retention and groundwater recharge, but it's also known for fostering a diverse and underserved user group, as well as operating as revenue neutral and demonstrating leadership in sustainable management practices. 
And these are the management practices perhaps are maybe the most interesting because they're ones where we actually engage the community to actually literally get their hands dirty and participate in that process. Again, trying to foster a connection to place. And finally, I sort of wanted to end with two projects, the River Ring in Brooklyn as well as the Tidal Basins. River Ring is really an extraordinary opportunity to provide a new model for urban shorelines, for spaces that are really constrained and tight. And the idea is to enhance access and connectivity. This is the last sort of missing link along the waterfront to restore natural habitats and to elevate the standard for urban waterfront resiliency and transform the way that New Yorkers interact with the East River. This is the site. It's really an ideal site for water access, for unique park programming. It has a shallow gravel bottom. The bathymetry is really shallow here. And you can see the existing platforms and pier structures as well as the concrete caissons. The plan actually uses three large in-water breakwaters, um, which form a series of nature trails that extend out to the existing caissons, which are retrofitted, um, allowing for a soft and living shoreline, as well as protected opportunities to engage the river and promote nature and estuary education, all of which really deeply resonated with the community here. So rather than building a hardened bulkhead edge, the breakwaters actually in the wetlands increased resilience by dissipating the wave energy and reducing flooding and erosion. But they also sustain habitat, improve water quality, enrich wildlife. They actually keep the beach in place, the East River, which is actually not a river, it's an estuary, but as you know is very turbulent, primarily because of ferry wakes um, on every day and they create calmer waters for safe in-water recreation. So the image on the left is without the breakwaters, and you can see the colors that are in the reds and yellows are that high wave energy. And when you put the breakwaters in, you actually see the, the blue, which is the calmer waters. Our ecologists sort of used Jamaica Bay, which is the preeminent wetland and shallows complex in the five boroughs, as an inspiration and a reference. Well, at obviously a very different scale. You can see the site in teeny, 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 tiny red, if you can even see it on Jamaica Bay. Um, some of the same existing conditions are sort of key components shared with our site plan. You can kind of see that at Jamaica Bay, you get this opening that allows this whole system to flush and not be stagnant. And this idea was also used for the river ring. And this image kind of shows everything coming together, the breakwaters, the habitat, the intertidal habitat, the upland park, the buildings, as well as the experience out in the water, which is really unique and buffered and insulated, quite different from being in a bulkhead condition. And all of these conditions, this is actually one of my favorite drawings, because they support a habitat mosaic. This is everything that's also happening underground. And this is an interconnected sequence of habitats that, when combined, of course, provide a higher habitat value for performance as well as biodiversity. The ring itself promotes access in and around the river, and it provides this very journey that ties together all of the other sort of more park-like amenities, the amphitheater, a beach, the tidal pools and salt marshes, and it leads you out to these nature trails and outposts. This is uh, an image of the beach, which allows people to engage the water, to sort of play and explore, and hopefully in the future, this would be one of the first places where New Yorkers could actually swim in the East River. There's also a focus on nature and estuary education, and this is, again, I think there's a deep partnership here with the Brooklyn Boat Works, with the Billion Oyster Project, as well as the YMCA, and the park's breakwaters are not only functional as resiliency infrastructure, but they're occupiable as nature trails, and this was something that we thought was really important, that you could actually get out there, experience the breakwater, and understand what it was doing. One last point on that I just wanted to make was that, you know, this is probably one of the first private investments in in-water resilience infrastructure, and it's also one of the projects that's really pushing the limits in the regulatory framework of New York City to increase co-benefits, building off of some of the programs that the Army Corps and the, the DEC are trying to sort of initiate. And I wanted to end with the tidal basins. Um, which many of you know is sited on a former marshland. Um, it's on the banks of the Potomac River. 
And it's a significant cultural landscape and prominent attraction that intentionally engages challenges and questions related to climate adaptation. It's the home to the Jefferson, the FDR, and the MLK memorials, as well as DC's iconic collection of cherry trees. The tidal basin was actually designed so that at high tide, the gates would open and fill the basin with water, and at low tide, the water would actually exit into the Washington Channel. The rush of water was designed to sort of sweep the leftover sediment away. But despite the gate system designed to protect it, the tidal basin is slowly sinking about a half an inch a year. And due to years of delayed maintenance and neglect, the floodgates are no longer operating as they were originally intended, allowing the river to rush over the gates in high tide. This coupled with rising water levels in the Potomac leads to sort of a daily inundation of the paths and the cherry trees. Climate change is, of course, also producing increasingly intense and frequent storms, which flood the tidal basin, the National Mall, and the surrounding city fabric. So we were invited as one of five participants in the 2020 Tidal Basins Ideas Lab, and as part of that, we actually proposed three scenarios because we didn't think that, you know, you really could even just think about one. And these together were sort of meant to construct an argument about the significance of the problems and how to address them. Each scenario considered a different approach. Um, the first one was curate entropy, and this really embraced the sort of inevitability of the decline and decay through a process of naturalization. There was the island archipelago, which allowed the waters of the Potomac to flood the tidal basin, and it had protective gardens around the monuments themselves. And then there was a kind of perhaps more standard approach, protect and preserve, which really proposed a large earthwork that created more parkland and opportunities for amenities and recreation while sort of keeping the water out. But I really wanted to talk about the first one a little bit, this notion of the curate entropy. So this is actually showing, you know, the, Ma the National Mall is actually protected by flooding here from the earthwork on the north side when you put in this device. Um, but all of the tidal basin itself on the south is actually allowed and subject to flood over time. And with increased flooding, the new wetlands and woodlands evolve, acting as a sponge to help protect the city from future flooding. The monuments sort of gracefully age and decay, and the new tidal basin is navigated via an elevated walk over a naturalized tidal marsh, allowing for new spatial relationships with the monuments. The result is really a totally new kind of landscape and an ecological aesthetic that grapples with and seek to shift the values, sort of thinking about adaptation, about beauty, about culture, and about ecology. So to close, I just wanted to say that, you know, as designers of the built environment, I think we are uniquely qualified to contribute to this effort of sort of adapting to climate change, but it's a contribution. You know, there must be, of course, a collective and collaborative and multidisciplinary action that needs to happen. And I think we're all sort of in agreement, hopefully, that our work now and in the future sort of needs to foster environmental health and resilience. It needs to foster social interaction and public well-being, and it needs to sort of create a connection to place and to community in order to actually be the essential infrastructure that we all say it is. But the work also arguably needs to inspire and enrich people's lives, to weave together the cultural, the physical, and the interpersonal worlds, to be resonant and relevant, to foster the long-term stewardship of land and water, and to help respond to the global call to climate action. So back to the idea of redefining beauty, you know, perhaps this lens of cohabitation and the concept of hoju can be one that allows us to fuse together notions of design and community and design and ecology rather than polarizing them. I really believe that the relationship between art and aesthetics, design, immersive experiences, as well as ecology and politics and social reform are not in opposition, and actually they're central to each other. And when they're aligned, you know, perhaps they can actually redefine and expand our own concepts of beauty.
Thank you.